Oh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm super excited uh, to be here. I mean, first of all, it's uh, it's a great meeting and it's nice uh, to meet so many people, many of whom I have met exactly here five years ago. But then, I mean, and that's even uh, more important, uh, I have the opportunity to talk about the project, which is uh, highly influenced by local work here in, uh, in Vilnius. And so this is about quantum simulation of time-dependent Hamiltonians, and now I start to try, oh yeah, this works like this. Perfect, yeah. Um, so, I mean, we are all aware, I mean, quantum simulations, I mean, that's something that has been developed very much in the last uh, 20 or even more years, and there's many experiments now that uh, do quantum simulations of uh, quantum many-body systems that really go beyond what we could do with uh, classical means of doing computations. But most of that is really limited to physics described by time-independent Hamiltonians. Yeah? And so we are currently thinking about how to extend that to questions where we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian. Yeah, and so I mean one example would for example be if you have now a quantum anybody system that is interacting with a time-dependent electromagnetic field, you have this time-dependent uh, uh, Hamiltonian, how do you quantum simulate it? No? Another example would be if you have now a system with phase transitions, many people are interested now in uh, in uh, quenching, I mean, going from one uh, phase to another one, one can do that really fast, one can do that really slowly, one can do that in finite time. Again, this now poses a question of quantum simulating a system with a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And then there's something that's maybe a bit, uh, bit more far-fetched, maybe a bit more for the future, but this is something that people uh, do in classical engineering a lot. No, I mean, like, if, uh, if you are developing a, a classical computer, uh, you do simulate the performance of that computer in advance. Yeah, so it is you take an existing computer in order now to simulate what you would expect from a future generation of computers. Yeah, and that's also something that we could think about in, uh, let's say, quantum engineering. Yeah, so if we're thinking about developing now a quantum te technological device, I mean, we could think about now really quantum simulating its performance based on existing, uh, existing devices. Yeah, and so that's why we're interested now in the question, how could we potentially realize uh, time-dependent uh, time quantum simulations or quantum simulation of time-dependent systems? And um, let me uh, start like really basic here. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm sure all of you uh, have seen this many times. I mean, this is really more like the textbook example of the problems that we're facing in quantum simulation. So uh, the most elementary example would be now here this lambda system with, uh, with three levels. Uh, we have in mind we would like to drive a transition between these two low-lying levels. This is forbidden for, uh, for selection rules. And so what we can do now, we can consider now driving the transition to this high-lying state uh, of resonantly, both uh, for, the, for the one state and for the, uh, for the two state. And then we get this effective model where we have this direct interaction between one and two as an effective process that does not exist in the, uh, in the underlying system. Yeah, and so there is now this is now what the what the dynamics would look like. So the, the red wiggly line, so this is now the actual the actual solution. Uh, the blue line, this is uh, this is what I uh, what I would get from the ideal system. So this is where I would really have this proper uh, this uh, proper direct interaction here. And Floquet theory uh, guarantees us that uh, at periodic points in time, I mean, the actual solution and my desired effective solution uh, coincide, so that is now I can take the system, which strictly speaking does not have this desired, uh, this desired coupling element, in order to simulate dynamics of a system with this, with this coupling element. Yeah, and so this is all based on Floquet theory. So Floquet theory is really is really super helpful here. So we can always use it if we have now time-dependent Hamiltonian with a periodic time dependence. And so now Floquet theory guarantees us that we can write the propagator now as this product of terms where we have now here this term induced by this time-independent effective Hamiltonian, which is then this object that we could uh, quantum simulate. And now here we have this micromotion operator that is this uh, periodic deviation from this, uh, from this, desired, uh, from this desired dynamics. And... <coughs> 
Now I can exp uh, now I can express this effective Hamiltonian as pretty much the underlying Hamiltonian in a different frame, and so this frame is exactly defined by this uh, by this micromotion operator, and so it vanishes periodically. So that allows us to actually really observe uh, the results uh, in uh, in practice. And so now here on the left hand side, now here we have this in Floquet theory time independent effective Hamiltonian. And yeah, our interest now lies in situations where we have a time dependent effective Hamiltonian. And uh, we uh, ev evidently would like to be able to have this micromotion vanish. It doesn't even need to be periodically, but it has to vanish at like some points in time, ideally desired points in time. And so how do we now find such decompositions of propagator into like a micromotion operator and a term described by, uh, by an effective Hamiltonian? And so there's well, various approaches that one could take and we're going for this uh, framework of flow equations. So flow equations, uh, I, I start now uh, decomposing the actual propagator into two terms, the one I call V and the other one I call U. And um, and I give them an index S because, I mean, there's not like a unique uh, decomposition of that. I mean, I can find arbitrarily many decompositions and I parameterize these different decompositions by some, uh, by some parameter S. Yeah, and then for each of these decompositions, then I could now uh, define a Hamiltonian that character uh, that will end up to be my, my effective Hamiltonian. And so now I have this I have this continuum of uh, of possible uh, of possible decompositions here, and uh, I don't just want like any decomposition. I want one that really has my desired properties. I mean, in particular, I want one where the micromotion really vanishes at desired points in time, so that I know one can actually observe this in an uh, in an experiment. And so this now I need to scan over all of these decompositions in order to figure out whether I can find one that is actually suitable for my, for my purposes. Yeah? And uh, so I do this by defining now an equation of motion for this, uh, for this uh, micromotion operator here. And so this equation of motion is now not an equation of motion in time, but it is an equation of motion in terms of this parameter, parameter S here, that characterizes my different decompositions. Yeah? So it is as I now propagate uh, this, uh, this, uh, this equation of motion here, I will now scan over many different possible decompositions with the hope to actually encountering a suitable one. And so this, uh, this equation of motion is now defined here in terms of this generator. So this is now an operator that now uh, induces uh, this, uh, this dynamics. And in a similar way now I can also write now an equation of motion for this Hamiltonian that I have here. Yeah? So this as I now keep propagating my micromotion operator, I always get a corresponding, uh, corresponding Hamiltonian. So this also this Hamiltonian now is propagating with an equation of motion determined in terms of this, uh, in terms of this generator. And uh, so now what I have to do now, I need to now come up with a definition for this, uh, for this generator that is such that my equation of motion here has an asymptotic solution. So this, if I go S going to infinity, so that uh, yields me a, a decomposition into a desired form. So this is where I have a micromotion operator that vanishes at desired points in time and where my effective Hamiltonian has desired properties. And so this is actually like a, like a technique that has been around for quite a while. So initially uh, this was not formulated now in terms of this Floquet type of theory, but rather for, uh, for uh, time independent Hamiltonians. It was concerned with the question, if I start now with a Hamiltonian with interactions, can I transform it into a frame in which I get a Hamiltonian of non-interacting uh, non systems? Uh, then, yeah, one can realize that one can actually map this problem of turning 
an interacting system into a non-interacting system, also in terms of, uh, of locale theory, and then one can start using uh, this flow equations framework for the definition of time-independent effective Hamiltonians doing, uh, doing regular locale theory. And then, uh, yeah, one can also now uh, expand uh, this idea to the concept of uh, time, in and, uh, time independent, oh, time dependent effective Hamiltonians. And this is really something where we got uh, lots of very nice inspiration from Victor Giedros and Egidius here from, uh, from uh, uh, Vilnius. And yeah, so now uh, we would like now to uh, to define a, a flow equation or generator for the flow equation that gives us now a suitable uh, decomposition. And so what we're doing, we are uh, we are now starting with a with a Hamiltonian that is time dependent, and we're defining it in terms of several frequencies. Now, I mean, if you do regular flow case theory, there is one fundamental frequency, so the Hamiltonian is periodic. So now here we're using a quasi-periodic Hamiltonian, that is, we have a vector of, uh, of, uh, of frequencies. And uh, so now we, uh, we need to consider now our equations of motion for the micromotion operator. And we want to make sure now that this micromotion vanishes at desired points in time. And so what do we pick as desired? So we pretty much now pick the one, the first frequency of our frequency vector here as, let's say, the fundamental frequency. So we say, I mean, we want to be able to observe the system after full periods with respect to this, uh, to this frequency. And so this frequency is now here omega 1. And so now we define our generator, and this is a complicated beast. I'm not really giving you all the details. I'm just telling you that there is one scalar factor here that is this exponential function minus one, yeah? That is, it vanishes after full periods with respect to this, uh, to this frequency, uh, frequency omega one. So it is no matter how complicated the rest before here is, we know at full periods the generator is vanishing. So that is, there's no dynamics in the slow equation. That is, the micromotion operator really remains the identity as we propagate these, these flow equations. Yeah. And um, yeah, so this now allows us to define, uh, to define these flow equations. Now at the end, we need, uh, we need to solve them. In practice, we're interested in systems that are too large to actually solve, uh, solve things analytically. So we typically need to do it uh, perturbatively. And so, yeah. Like, uh, like very, uh, very typically, we use a high frequency expansion. High frequency expansion typically means that now the driving frequency, so the driving frequency in regular flow case theory, uh, should be large as compared to all relevant matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. So this is kind of standard in flow case theory. We will also require require that here. But now. Uh, there are several frequencies in our driving pattern, yeah, and so now we can ask, well, I mean, what's the relation now between uh, between those different frequencies, no? And so now we will use this frequency omega one in order to create processes that uh, that really dress the dynamics, so that it gives us these effective processes for uh, for the uh, for our quantum simulation. And uh, we could now require that this frequency should be large as compared to all the other frequencies, yeah, and if we did that, then we would pretty much do adiabatic flow case theory, yeah. So that would really mean uh, we have we have now this very fast, uh, very fast driving and a very slow modulation of our driving uh, pattern, and so this pretty much at every point in time we can do flow case theory, and then just at a later point in time we realize well our driving pattern has changed, we have a different flow case Hamiltonian. Yeah. Or we could go a step further and do not require now a separation of these uh, of these frequencies here, yeah. And that would now really mean that we can now define these time-dependent effective Hamiltonians without resorting to this adiabatic approximation. And yeah, so now I just would like to come back uh, to this uh, to this lambda system uh, to just give you now a flavor of what this uh, construction looks like. So this now we would be after coming up with this effective coupling here, but then we can also now modulate this coupling, uh, this coupling in time. Yeah. And so first thing that we realize now, if we, uh, if we want now to realize time dependent coupling here, and we do not do this now in this adiabatic fashion, then I mean, we will get 
excitations of this excited state, which we do not get now in this perfect uh, in this perfect Floquet case. And so in order to compensate for that, we can now take into account additional resonant uh, driving in this uh, in the system. And then now we can ask ourselves, I mean, how do we need now to shape temporally our driving patterns in order to arrive at these uh, desired time dependence of this uh, of this coupling element? So this is now uh, the the Hamiltonian for lambda system. We have the off resonant driving. We have the uh, we have the resonant driving. And uh, yeah, so this is now the uh, the expression for this effective uh, effective coupling element so here we have these uh, we have these um, uh, Fourier components of our driving pattern and you can see I mean this is bilinear in the Fourier components of our driving it has this uh, 1 over omega 1 so this is now this uh, typical form of this uh, second order uh, perturbative uh, perturbative expression so that is this is now where the high frequency expansion comes in but now here we also have this uh, this ratio between our two driving frequencies, and so I call this I call this eta, yeah. And so now if we were doing now adiabatic Floquet theory, eta would be a small uh, parameter. But so now if you look at this prefactor here, you can see I mean that this is not now linear or quadratic or anything in eta, but this is now really taking in eta eta exactly so this is, is not perturbative now in the ratio of our uh, of our driving frequencies uh, so what you can also see now if we were taking the limit of going to this uh, to this adiabatic case everywhere where we have eta we can simply we can simply drop eta and then the entire lengthy prefactor simply uh, simply reduces to one and so this then now we would just have the common expression that this effective uh, Rabi frequency is nothing but the modulo squared of the time dependent Rabi frequency divided by the detuning or by the driving frequency. So that is, I mean, this adiabatic limit is naturally contained in this, uh, in this uh, solution here. So yeah, here just like uh, give you a few examples of uh, of uh, what this would look like in practice. So here we now considered uh, a Gaussian profile for this uh, for this uh, for this coupling given in uh, like this dashed uh, black line. Um, then we limited the uh, the driving pattern to a three Fourier components. So this we cannot really. Uh, resolve this exactly, but we can actually do this in very good approximation. So that is the the red line is what we can actually achieve. So you can barely see deviation from the ideal Gaussian. Now here the left case, this is where this adiabatic approximation is still reasonably good. Here on the right, this is uh, probably beyond the adiabatic approximation. And uh, so now, well, I mean, the yeah, the red line is what we really get if we use the uh, exact framework. The blue line is what we would get if we were simply using adiabatic Floquet. So you can see here on the left, I mean, it's not such a bad approximation, but here on the right, it actually, I mean, uh, fails uh, reasonably uh, to a reasonable extent to approximate the uh, exact solution. Uh, the the green and the uh, and the yellow just indicate the driving patterns that uh, one would need to apply in order to get uh, to get that uh, solution. And you can see, I mean, this is now not symmetric around the uh, around the, the center, despite the fact that the solutions are supposed to be uh, symmetric. And in the adiabatic case, I mean, it would actually be symmetric. And so the deviation from the symmetry also gives you an idea of this aspect of uh, beyond adiabatic uh, beyond adiabatic dynamics. And yeah, so this is pretty much all I wanted uh, I wanted to show you. I mean, I've been uh, limiting the discussion here to this reasonably elementary case of this uh, of this lambda system. Now, of course, you can uh, you can now start to uh, do these constructions also for more uh, more complicated uh, Hamiltonians. Um, one does need to notice that, like really finding now desired uh, driving protocols, 
in order to get desired Hamiltonians uh, becomes a bit more complicated than in uh, in regular Floquet theory. But apart from that, I mean, all this Floquet engineering uh, that uh, people have done over the last uh, 10 or so years really applies applies reasonably uh, straightforwardly. And then I certainly would like to acknowledge uh, Boyan Shi. I mean, so this is like the project that he did in the first year of his uh, of his PhD. So he has done really all the all the uh, all the actual uh, actual work in that and yeah i'm very happy for your for your attention thanks so much thank you thank you and this time we have even time for several questions sure. yes please yes thank you very much for this um, nice talk um, i have a question so how much of a constraint is this uh, 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 fact that you're asking for a vanishing micromotion once during the period? So for instance, if I think about these schemes Monika Eidelsburger is using to engineer these artificial gauge fields, it relies on sort of having sinusoidal drives of different phases at different lattice sites. So I think in this case, it would be difficult. Do you have any idea, intuition, sort of what uh, uh, restriction this means? Or did you think about this? You mean what restrictions this means in order to what we can achieve or exactly exactly Well, I mean I would say I mean if we didn't have that restriction I could achieve anything No, I mean I can pretty much I can always take now two uh, two Hamiltonians and they will always be related by uh, by by some by some time dependent unitary yeah, so it is if you don't really care about the micro motion at all, you allow the micro motion to completely, completely explode. No, I can realize any Hamiltonian. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, there will certainly be quite some uh, some restrictions. You probably wanted to, to have a much more explicit answer from me. No, um, I uh, I don't think I can I can give that to you. I think one would need to really look at the at the individual case, try to work it out, and then see whether one gets it to work or not. But I can't really I can't really now tell you, okay, I mean for this class of problems there's no concern and, and this you couldn't do at all. No, sorry, I can't do that. Uh, okay. Any other question? Uh, if it's not the yeah, please. Uh, thank you, Florian, for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about e eta. So eta should be less than one because the... Yeah, can I, you... I don't think I can go back. Ah, you can't? <laughs> no. And anyway, but eta uh, should be less than one because it's ratio between leading, uh, between the uh, second frequency and leading, fre leading frequency. Uh, do you need another restriction for eta? It's just less than one or uh, you should uh, less than something less than half or, or something additional uh, or it's the only restriction to be less than one no i would in order to be this correct uh, answer no no i would say i would say it's uh, it's less it's less than one i mean let's say i mean if you look at the perturbative expansion i mean you will get higher powers uh, of uh, of uh, of eta in these terms that 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 we're neglecting no and so now if eta was larger than one I mean, then we're not sure what's happening with these uh, with these larger with these larger powers, but as long as eta doesn't uh, doesn't exceed one, I mean, we don't see a see a concern. Okay. Thank you. 